Welcome to the wide world of esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Noor. Today, my guest is Jacob Johnson, the owner of Lagger Gaming. Our topic is esports branding, design, and content creation, and much more today, since Jacob knows quite a bit about this industry. So, welcome, Jacob. Hey, happy to be here. All right. So, uh, you know, I know you have been in the business for a long time. Tell us about how your career in esports began. Yeah, so basically, I would say back when like Call of Duty Ghost first came out, we had clan wars and little online things we could do with our friends. And that's really where I started playing games. Um, like most people, I played games all the time. I still do play games all the time. Um, so definitely about middle school ish, towards the beginning of high school, um, I used to play a lot of games with my school friends. Um, we made teams online, started doing little tournaments here and there. Um, back then, obviously, esports were still like even newer than it is now. Um, and then we just slowly grew from there, obviously meeting other gamers. I learned that like, hey, there's esports or there's gaming for every game, not just Call of Duty at that point. And that's where I met a lot more of my friends and even the people who I hang out with and run my team with now, I met them through early days like that. Um, certainly after that, I started hosting events uh, myself here in Nashville at the score. Um, sadly, they're closed down now, but they were an event center that catered to pretty much all of Middle Tennessee. Um, through there, I met a lot of the Smash TOs, a lot of the other fighting game TOs, and then QMite in Tennessee, um, the people who do a lot of the majors here in not only Tennessee, but also the Southeast. Um, and slowly from there, just been growing my network, meeting new people, and going, going, going up from there. So uh, tell us about what you were doing at, uh, for Vanderbilt. Yeah, so, so Vanderbilt, um, they do a lot of events, um, whether it's eSports, other events. Um, I usually loan them my equipment since I have a lot of equipment compared to some of the other organizers in our city and state. Um, especially when it comes to Klejic eSports, a lot of those guys don't necessarily have the, the funding from the schools to do programs. So if I come and say, hey, I have six PlayStations or four Nintendo Switches that you can use for a tournament, they're happy to take those. And of course, I'll help out. Um, I'll usually play in the events too. I'm obviously not the best, but I'll usually play hang out for the day and everything and just help grow stuff, whether it's at a local level, collegiate level, or even higher. So um, what is Lagger Gaming? Yeah, so basically my organization, um, I have literally ran with that name forever. Um, even before I really created the team, that was always like my personal name. Um, people always like to ask me like where that name come from. And I think like the best and like silly explanation I can give that really is like, my internet used to suck. It still technically sucks. Um, and I would always lag a lot. So people would always call me a lagger. And then I just made the name look cool and been running with it for over 10 years at this point. So is that your game tag? More or less, yes. Um, obviously, I, I try to like differ from it, especially when I'm talking about like, the organization as a whole. But yeah, deep down, it was more or less my first like in-game name, you could say. Um, it's definitely still like my staple. OK. And so what is what is your company been doing? Um, so definitely like full on hosting events and everything before COVID shut everything down. Um, since COVID started shutting things down, we did see a lot of shift in like sports as a whole, um, especially with like football, basketball, all of this stuff being canceled because COVID. The only thing that was really going on in the collegiate space was esports, thankfully. And at that point, I was already helping a lot of our local colleges, but I decided to help our non-local colleges, so to say. Um, so I started getting connections like Geospore. Um, they work with the Indiana Sports Corporation, one of the few states departments that properly support esports as they should. Um, hopefully more will in the future. Going from there, just getting more connection with colleges, doing everything from there. And um, since we do partner with those um, colleges, I have started working on those and getting my players more access to education. Um, for example, we have a Latin America Street Fighter V player um, currently in Panama, and he's looking to come to the United States for education. Um, and through those connections, everything, I'm helping get his visa so he's able to come here and pursue his education. And thankfully, since we already have a big like array of schools through that connection, I can help him like pinpoint which schools have what he wants, and we'll let him win the championships, basically. Um, so definitely using those connections to pair my players with education if they want to pursue it. 
Um, most of my players are that age, um, some younger, some older, but normally between like college age. So um, I understand you do content creation as well. Yeah, so my organization, it, it, it's kind of, where it comes to like the branding, so I brand it a little different than like mainstream, I would say. Um, so one way we do this is we have multiple partnerships, um, both through Cardamax, Sector6, and Control Freak. Um, those three companies all give us partnerships, um, obviously more or less than the commission deals that we normally see in esports. Um, when we work with the partners, we get our players individual uh, affiliate dashboards, individual partnership dashboards, and more or less, I take control of their name, likeness, and image, um, and basically use that to make them a effective brand image. Um, so like a lot of my players, when they come to me, like, yes, they're good at playing and everything, but they don't necessarily have a brand or something built off of that. So I work with them, getting them stuff as, so let's say like personal logos or getting them just a brand image, whether that is a logo, just a face look at, more or less when they make content. I then use that to basically work with through our Sector 6 partnership, get them a store front, up and running so they have merchandise provided to them through us. Um, and then we do the same with our rest of our partners. So in terms of them just being under our organization, they now have three additional sources of revenue on top of physical merch they can sell and that image and or logo tied to them. And basically by doing this, I am me as an organization and branding them through uh, those outlets rather than having them promote and make the organization money through those outlets. So it's a lot of trickle down, more or less me giving more money back to the players um, in return, growing them. And then of course they're tied to us. So it grows us both in the end. Um, I think that model is more efficient for the players. Uh, maybe not the organization, but it's definitely gives back more to the players, which I'm sure they love. Why is branding important for players? Yeah, so I, I think branding is very important when it comes to players. Um, a lot of players, both new school, old school, they think that they can just play games and that's about it. Um, when it comes to like succeeding in esports, you see almost every single one of the top players, top content creators, anything, they don't just play games. They also produce content, whether it's streaming, doing YouTube videos, anything they do, they're not just playing games. And a lot of these newer players think that like, all you need to do to make it big is be good at video games. It takes a lot more than that. Like you can be great at video games. You can be winning all of these tournaments, but if you don't have somewhere they can watch you, somewhere where they can connect with you, it, it can only go so far. And that definitely holds a lot of people back, whether they know it or not. And hopefully they see it sooner rather than later. So it doesn't limit them so much. So content creation in for you or in your players is that on Twitch or what, and what other, um, what other platforms do you use? Um, so definitely like I let the players use whatever they prefer. Um, some of my players obviously love Twitch, been with Twitch since day one. Um, I have other players who have decided to leave Twitch for other platforms, whether it's YouTube gaming, Trovo, just any of these other platforms. Um, a few of my players were also partnered on Mixer before they shut down, unfortunately. Um, so definitely, I let the players advertise and promote and basically be on whatever platform they want. And I help them utilize that. So is the content creation that is being done um, by them and, and uh, by uh, Lagger, um, is it only video content creation or are you doing content creation for other platforms like um, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn? Uh, we, we definitely do things on those other platforms. Um, when it comes to like social media, a lot of what we focus on is like that, uh, like generating that image, so to say. So for example, through our partners, our partners would be like, hey, we're releasing a new product and then we'll make a social media campaign for a month about that new product. And then each player that or each member that's involved in that collaboration would know like, hey, I'm responsible for this many social media posts, whether it's whichever platform they're on. Hey, I'm responsible to post this video talking about this company, or I'm responsible for making a post about something. And it's basically my players have full, um, they're able to participate as much or as little as they want, uh, mostly because they know the more they participate, the more they would make. Um, so definitely I don't hold any of my players to like strict requirements when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, I like to let them do what they want, do what they're capable of without ever making them feel rushed or ever making them feel like I'm like being strict, so to say.
you ever have to go in and and uh, uh, direct them in a different way, like to uh, tell them that uh, they need to do a certain things to improve their brand? Um, I like obviously I'll give suggestions, but just coming in saying, "Hey, change this 100 percent." No, um, I don't like doing that. Especially every player has their own personality, their own way of doing things. And I think if if we're making content, we're doing this stuff as ourselves rather than doing it like by a script. It's definitely a lot better, a lot more personal, and it usually performs better because the people watching it even know themselves. Like, hey, they mean this. They're not just reading off of a script or something. So it definitely helps. How do you measure success um, with their brands? Um, so definitely the, the way I see it is a lot of people in esports, they think when you succeed, you have a million followers, you have 10 million on YouTube, something like that. The way I see success is basically if you achieve what you want to achieve. Like for me, like obviously my organization is not the biggest, but I believe with everything we've done, we have truly succeeded. I feel happy with what I accomplished. So as long as the players reach the goals they set out. Um, I consider that good. I consider that a win. Um, I think that's a lot of people hold themselves down when it comes to that. Um, they say like, oh, we only want big achievements, no small achievements or no small milestones. Um, I think beating any milestone, breaking any achievement is still a win. Um, I think that's what separates a lot of people, whether it's esports or not. It's just succeeding and being that number one person doesn't always mean you have all these followers. Sometimes it just means you're committing and achieving the goals you set out for, big or small. So do you think number of followers is more important or do you think engagement or, or a combination of those? Um, I think it can be a healthy combination, especially like for me, um, some of my bigger players in terms of like following or viewers are not always the ones that can make the most when it comes to like our partnerships, so to say. Um, like for me, one of my best players in terms of like selling volume and pushing through paid promotions, he's barely a Twitch affiliate where I have members or partners on Twitch who can't perform as well as them. Um, I think that's where like the, the RNG aspect comes into it, where it's like sometimes you, you just have that following that can help push you that extra step. Sometimes you haven't earned that following yet. So it, it does vary, but I think a healthy combination of both work, um, especially you, once one does good, the other one would do good um, most of the time, and they kind of teeter-totter, but still improve themselves both equally. So what games are your um, players uh, playing? Yeah, so we're primarily um, right now in the fighting game community, whether it's um, Street Fighter V, Tekken, Smash Brothers, that, that's where we're at right now mostly. Um, we do work with a rogue company team. We also work with the PUBG team. Um, I definitely try to be as like, as like involved the most people as possible without like clouding up a lot, um, especially when it comes to fighting games. Usually you have like the pro circuit season and then an off season for about four or five months. And that's where those other games come in and really like keep us active while we're waiting for the next competition to start or the next season to begin kind of thing. You're one of those uh, business people in esports who have been around a long time, and you really do come from grassroots. Do you have any advice um, to those who are newer to the industry? Um, definitely, like like I was talking about with the success, like don't don't think you're a fairer until you have all these followers. Don't think you're not going to make it anywhere unless if you become like a Twitch partner. Um, just just let yourself know that success comes in all shapes and sizes. Um, I Thankfully, I learned that earlier in my career than most, um, especially like for me. Right now, I'm barely 23. I have not only hosted events. I have not only won events. I have not only won collegiate events. Um, not only even now, I teach esports management um, on Umity and other platforms. Like I have dipped my, my toes necessarily in every field of this. And I feel like I have succeeded everywhere I have tried solely because esports, unlike other sports, you don't necessarily need tons of money to even try it. You can more or less do anything in esports free, whether it's playing in tournaments, whether it's using amateur graphic design uh, software, whether you're casting or broadcasting events. You don't even need a webcam for that kind of stuff. More or less, all you need is a mic, and everyone has a mic if they're playing games ready. So people don't realize that esports is essentially the cheapest thing to try out. 
meaning you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. So um, I'm I'm curious about your uh, teaching endeavors. Um, I've been teaching a, an introduction to esports class on the Ali uh, program for uh, University of Hawaii and uh, uh, show a lot of videos in my in my class um, and talk about just things about the metaverse, about NFTs, about each game and about what esports is and the business of esports. Tell us what what you're teaching and how you teach it. Yeah, so right now um, I'm working on six total courses. I only have one out currently. Um, my focus on these, obviously, like the first one's gonna be more or less overview. Um, the first topic I wanna really dive in is just hosting events. Um, a lot of people don't realize a lot of like the niche and little things that go into organizing events, um, whether it's an online tournament or in-person tournament, there's just a lot of little things that go into it. Um, and like for me, I hosted my first in-person event at the age of 14. Um, by all means, if the land center people didn't give me a chance, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, for more, more of my time, I haven't been able to sign leases myself. Um, I couldn't even rent the equipment from Renton Center by myself just because I was too young to sign anything. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that when it comes to signing for these things, it's not always just being 18 or just being 21. I mean, especially if you're renting a venue or renting a car or anything like that, a lot of those places even require you to be 25. So 21, just so you're you're off of like state funded stuff so they can trust you, whether it's through credit or anything. Um, so like, I'm talking about like how I got over those challenges, like, hey, I wasn't old enough to run a venue, so this is what I did. Or I wasn't old enough to rent equipment from Run Center, so this is what I did. And basically overcame a lot of those challenges that someone younger wanting to do it would face. Um, and basically going from there, um, I want my other courses to just be like branding. And one big thing is like, there's so many careers in esports outside of just playing games. A lot of people just think, oh, you're a gamer, you play games. It's like, no, I'm a gamer. I own a team. I make graphics. I edit videos. Like, there's a lot more to it than just playing games. And a lot of people, both in and out of esports, don't realize that. Sure. You know the eco the esports ecosystem is huge and it's impressive to hear about you starting at such a young age now let me ask you was it even called esports when you started <laughs> oh de definitely not back then there wasn't really like teams and organizations everyone was just called like clans uh that's definitely where like people like phase clan started or like even uh, Team Caliber, a lot of teams back then weren't necessarily organization. They were more or less teams, whether it were, they were like sniping teams of Call of Duty or just clans on other team-based games like Gears of War, Halo, that kind of thing. Um, esports is definitely a newer term, um, or at least a more used properly term, I would say. Uh, but back then, yeah, that it was still very young at that point. Sure. Uh, one of my early guests was Fatality. And uh, I don't know if uh, you're familiar with him, but he was doing winning a lot in the early days. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen a lot of change. What are some of the changes that you've seen as uh, in the pa past? Uh, I mean, uh, ten plus years since you've been in the business. Uh, definitely, like the the tolerance of esports has definitely changed, um, especially when I host events, especially with me being younger. If I'm at an event, hosting event, or just being there, and I see a, a parent dropping off their kid who is either my age or younger, any kid, I always make it a point to go to that parent and like ask them, like, hey, what's your opinion of this? Like, do you have any questions I can answer? Um, and a lot of times they ask me like questions like, is this a real thing? Is gaming even real? That kind of thing. Like, like the questions that someone who has no idea would ask, of course. And I always make sure to go up to them, say, hey, this is a real thing. Um, there's plenty of people, even like me, who had education paid through esports. Um, someone like me being a team owner, I even tell them like, hey, like back then I was 16 hosting a tournament, you're bringing your 16 year old son to. I'm here, he's there. You can do anything, basically. Um, and I feel I have helped many parents either understand or accept that esports is a real thing, um, especially when I bring education in it. Um, I think anytime I say, hey, you can get a scholarship for esports and the parents go like, whoa, that's a real thing. And then I can basically use that as a selling point to let them either like approve of their child playing in esports or at least like be tolerant of it, so to say, depending on the parent, of course. 
Sure. How do you think the pandemic has changed um, esports, if if it has, or how has it impacted it? Um, I I think it has definitely helped. E it, it it yeah, it has definitely helped esports. Um, I think the biggest boost, is especially when it shut down all traditional sports, and the only thing being played was games, just because you have the ability to do it online. Um, so definitely that has kickstarted it. Um, and I feel without the pandemic shutting everything down, collegiate esports would not have gotten the big boost it did. Colleges wouldn't have thrown money into it, wouldn't have got staff for it, wouldn't have opened clubs and programs for it. So I, I believe that it helped the collegiate esports scene greatly and definitely impact everything attached to it. Um, so I, I think it did help a lot. Um, sadly, the pandemic sucks anyways, but there is some bright sides to it, like uh, helping esports both at collegiate and non-collegiate. Terrific. And so what is what are your next steps in your career? And with your um, Yeah, so so my next steps personally um, is definitely um, I want to get into a college as a esports director or a, a head coach, depending on college. They name those positions very differently. Um, I do have a few offers, still considering a lot of those um, just because of time, distance, that sort of thing. But definitely, I personally want to get in a position where I can be like, hey, I have helped my organization. Now I can also help a college. Um, whether it's a college or even another organization, I want to be able to basically use that as my next steps, like, hey, I ran my organization, now I'm going to run a college program and help them both succeed. Um, whether they're tied in together, I run them both separately. Um, I want to be able to make them both succeed. Um, as for the team, definitely I'm um, working on getting one or two more partners for the next year, just so we can compete more, we can get more people under the team. Um, a lot of my fighting game players have been with us for four plus years, so definitely getting some of their friends, getting some of the other players they know underneath the team will help everyone in the end and just basically grow from there. Um, and then use all of my connections to just grow. I'm, I think for the next while is just primarily growing. Um, eventually, once things are more safe, I do want to go back to hosting events, um, whether it's in Nashville, whether it's in Tennessee, or even outside of Tennessee. I definitely want to be able to host events, which I can. It's definitely the funnest time. Sure. Well, that's fantastic. So how can people find you if... Uh, if they want to contact you, especially if they want to contact you about uh, one of your uh, um, uh, uh, hopes and, and dreams for your future. Yeah, so definitely um, you can follow the organization on all the major platforms, um, just Lagger Gaming. Um, me personally, you can follow me, um, Lagger underscore VX3X on all platforms. Um, I am also on both eFuse and Geo, uh, which are more collegiate based platforms. Um, I am also on Discord. Um, basically, follow me anywhere. Um, since I am the owner of the team, I'm on any of the social media accounts. So I'm pretty easy to reach out to if you need to about anything. Well, Jacob, it has been such a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, you are such an inspiration to so many people having started doing this at such a young age and um, having progressed your company um, and still growing and, and uh, moving into the future. Yeah, thank you. It was definitely fun joining you talking about this. All right. So anyway, thank you to our viewers for joining us today. And next week, my guest will be Carl Gamez. Gomez, excuse me, uh, head coach and team manager of an esports team in the Philippines. See you then.